Welcome to the second of our WBWE sessions. Um, this is the time of year where so many of us would be in Amsterdam for the World Bulk Wine Exhibition. And actually, a lot of people who aren't there probably should be there. The fascinating thing about the wine world is that this year, of course, we haven't had ProVine, we haven't had Expo, we haven't had Vin Italy, all these events that, that, that we've missed. And actually, the World Bulk Wine Exhibition doesn't necessarily get as much notice as some of those events. It's not as big. The stands aren't as flashy. Um, it, you know, it isn't, it isn't as, as glitzy an affair. But for everyone who goes there, it actually is where some of the most interesting conversations of the entire year take place. And I can say that because as a journalist, as a consultant, as, as an observer and analyst of the industry, I've been going, I've been paying my own way to go to the, the, the Amsterdam Fair um, for, I think, seven years. I've lost track of how many years. I've, I think I've done every year, in fact. And to me, the conversation with the actual because there's nobody who's actually there in Amsterdam either selling wine or buying wine and there, there aren't that many factors who take people. and fascinatingly what you can see is the reality of this year's market and indeed what's left from last year and what people are looking forward to in the future and the conferences there have also been a major part of the event and that has led to why um, the World Wine, well, Wine Exhibition is holding these events, uh, these online events, as a kind of a way of carrying on um, what would be happening in Amsterdam. And then alongside this, there's something called WBWE Connect, where um, essentially it's almost acting as a broker, but where uh, people who would be exhibiting are being put in contact with uh, people who would be buying. And I think um, that I, I don't yet know. I think that started yesterday and it's running through till December the 4th. I'm not involved with it at all, but I can see the logic of it. And I can see that in the future, quite a lot of exhibitions will have that combination of online, offline. Ironically, I think in a way um, that uh, WBWE Connect may almost slightly be uh, competing with my guest, uh, this evening, uh, Greg Livingood, but I think he can the competition. Greg Livingood is partner and CEO of Ciati, and Ciati is the broker that everybody um, ought to know if they're interested in uh, the wine world, bulk wine, not just bulk wine, we'll be talking about it in a broader sense. Um, and I think the important thing about Ciati is that it is you look the moment you, you you lift the lid and see what's inside or lift the hood of the of the car if you like that is a major part of the engine of the wine world and what we'll be talking about this evening um is what is bulk because when i meet people i think one year i flew back i flew to as it happened to new zealand and i met two of the best at an event there two of the best known um us wine uh critics were uh, at a dinner and they said, where have you been? And I said, I've been at the Bulk Wine Fair in Amsterdam. And they both went, why would you do that? Why, why would you go there? Obviously, you'd want to be at a Grand Chateau in Bordeaux. You'd want to be in Burgundy. You'd want to be in Napa. Why? And I said, because that's where it's all really happening. And they said, yeah, but all the wine must be awful. And I said, no, because actually there's that silent area where we all taste 400 wines. And it's amazing how good a lot of the wine is and how premium a lot of it is. And that gives me the opportunity to introduce you, Greg, and uh, to talk a little bit about what your vision sitting in Marin County in, in uh, California as a leading as global broker, but also broking within the US for US wine, within exporting US wine, or people want to sell export wine from the US, and indeed large amounts of bulk wine coming into the US from Europe and everywhere else. So how do you see the world in November 2021? Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. I've uh, uh, been looking forward great to having this. You. I, I, also, I also wish we were uh, in Amsterdam. Um, I've always, I always look forward to that trip every year and seeing everybody from around the world. And it's uh, disappointing not to be there now, but uh, Someday soon, hopefully we'll get back on track. Um, 
So how do I see it today uh, for, from from a from a local perspective here in the U.S. the the market um, is is absolutely uh, 180 degrees in the opposite direction of where we were this time last year. Um, in in late 2019, uh, we were still suffering what I would say was a was a glut of bulk wine here in the marketplace. Uh, we had a a huge 18 crop, much like the rest of the world, 18 crop uh, globally was was giant. Um, sales were sluggish, not only on the bulk market but on the street here in here in the U.S. There were the I think the talk at the time was you know wh why is wine declining in in preference and in sales in the U.S. There, there was a lot of talk about uh, hard seltzers and you know other other alternative beverages and and you know even even things like cannabis growing in the in the US and was that uh, was that the end of wine growth that was that was kind of the drumbeat uh, back in November of 19 and at the same time can, can I change interrupt on... the... sure. sure of course you just interrupt there's something else that happened as well when we were in November we can't forget that October 24th uh, president trump had imposed his tariffs on a lot of European wine, that 25% tariff, and there was always there's also been that threat of the 100%. But let's put that to one side. So that was also on the uh, hanging over everybody in Amsterdam last November. Yes, yes, um, and and unfortunately, I don't know that those tariffs are going away anytime soon. Even even though it it seems that we are having some clarity on the direction of the government here uh, at this point, we. We're hopeful that we'll have one president in January, uh, but we are uh, <laughs> we're we're moving forward. Uh, but but with that, you know what I am seeing here and what I'm reading is that there there is not um, it's not a priority uh, of the new administration to to deal with those tariffs initially. So so I think we're looking. So you're right. That was another piece of of I would say negativity for the wine market here. Um, you have you know, you have a lot of importers that that have suffered. Uh, you know, so a lot of U.S. businesses have suffered based on those tariffs. Um, and, and and in addition to that, to, you know, our, we're having uh, like some other places in the world, we're having a tough time with China on trade, and and so our our business with China essentially evaporated uh, over you know over issues that were not wine related, but wine always sure. does seem to get thrown into the mix. We're high profile, and it sounds good, I guess to. Uh, put tariffs on wine, but um, you know. So, so I think just to round out my my answer to to where things were back then, uh, you know, it was tough. It was very very tough. And the and the future of the wine business in in the U.S. Um, you know was in doubt from a from a growth potential. We were we were looking to you know try to stem the losses rather than figure out how to grow the business and grow the grow the industry. Um, so it's so it was it was a tough time back then. Things are much much different today. Um, so, so hold on. So COVID that. COVID comes in at the early part of the year. So we're starting the year. It's a January February uh, March. Wow! It's all suddenly we're we're moving into hard times. And then as the years progressed, of course, we've had the fires in California. So why is it all looking? better you could i could imagine that things might be looking worse well what, what's looking good okay so um yeah so so first of all as i mentioned the 18 crop was huge everywhere so we were mm -hmm. we were long supply in in most countries um starting in 19 you had the southern hemisphere crop come in light which was which was good you started you started to see uh, that it was, certainly wasn't going to look like 18, and then and then so the 19 crop was light, so that was a good start. Then we got to uh, let's call it March here, February, I think, in Europe, where where COVID really took hold, um, when things were uh, things were ratcheting up rather quickly. Um, and the big thing that happened here at that point is. You know, we'd been talking about premiumization for the previous four years. You know, the economy was strong. People were trading up in in uh, their you know in their drinking habits, and they were buying buying less, but buying at a higher price, um, which which didn't didn't help the overall bulk market. 
Um, we go into the situation where we start seeing quarantines in the U.S. or, or in some places in the U.S., and the behavior started to change, and people started to look at uh, going, and, and, and they had to go buy their, their wine at the supermarket rather than going to their favorite restaurant and ordering, you know, ordering a $75, $100 bottle of wine. They were now going to the store and buying maybe a $20 bottle or a $20 three-liter box. Um, and, and volume started to come back a little bit, and people started, in this, in this country anyway, they started to look at wine again. Uh, as opposed to seeing that that and uh, you know big growth in the seltzers and the and the um, and the uh, spirits, so right out of the gate things started to look a little bit better from a volume perspective here. So now, Greg, can I interrupt you? Because here that gives me the opportunity to ask you to define what your vision of bulk wine is because i think to um, a lot of people watching this may be regulars at the bulk market and know what we're talking about. but i think a lot of people who don't know imagine that it's absolutely the bottom end of of everything that's that's wine that it all it's less than a dollar a, a liter or whatever and as we've had we've talked before about this uh the some of the wines that you are actually dealing might well be napa cabernet being sold from one a state in Napa to another, it still goes through the bulk market. That's obviously a tiny part of what you do. But in terms of pricing, what sort of range of prices might you get in terms of the bulk market? Well, first of all, it's at, it's actually not that small of a piece of our business. The Napa, okay. Sonoma, uh, even Central Coast of California. There's there's the the in the California business and the U.S. business, including you, know, you look at Washington State and you look at Texas and some of these other places where they do produce a fair amount of wine. Uh, there are several bulk markets. You know, we have the you know the export bulk market or the or the value end of the market which which comes from the southern san joaquin valley in california and that's where that's where big production lies in california and it's and it's a bit cheaper like you say that's the stuff you find you know at the bottom end of the shelf uh in in the supermarket and that's a big piece of the business for sure uh but there's there's certainly a huge premium business and trade that takes place in california we we see wines from Napa, Sonoma, Lake County, Mendocino, Monterey. And so those prices, just to give you an idea, um, you know, Napa Cabernet uh, trades, you know, upwards of 10 to $15 per liter. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's significant trade there. Uh, and, and the, the way that wine finds its, play, it finds its way to the market is different by supplier. There are suppliers that make bulk wine uh, for the purpose of generating cash flow. There are those that make bulk wine in Napa because they only use 80% of what they grow and 20% and doesn't quite make the cut for their brand. And so they sell that off. Um, so there's, and, and there are companies uh, like in Australia, you have companies that uh, specialize in producing bulk wine for the bigger corporations that don't necessarily want all those assets on the book. So they would prefer to go out and do bulk contracts and have, have somebody make very premium wine for them. So you're saying, so the, the year we, we, we're going into the early part of the year, we've got quarantine, people are going out to the supermarkets rather than restaurants. The $20, $25 wine, which involves quite a lot of, of, of bulk wine, is getting better. And then as we're heading towards the harvest in uh, August, obviously we've got fires. And the fires were in some pretty premium parts of California, weren't they? That's correct. So, so you're so you're absolutely on track here. So, so things started to get a little bit better through the through the uh, spring, um, but prices were still relatively depressed here in in all ends of the bulk market because there was just too much wine in the market, and you, and a lot of that pressure was coming from the top down as there was too much wine in Napa and Sonoma and on the coast because that's where the really big crop was in 18. We're in the premium coastal areas. And so um, when things, uh, when, when the fires did start uh, in, in August, um, we started to see, um, we started to see that it was going to be significant, a significant event. And uh, we knew from our previous history in 17 and in some degree 18, that you know, smoke taint is a is an issue that that we have to deal with, 
um, several wineries here decided uh, in order, you know, their strategy was we're probably going to have to go light on the 2020 crop here in California, especially in the premium areas. Let's go back and buy all the bulk wine we can find from the 18 and 19 vintages. And they essentially cleaned out the market. You know, you had all this excess wine just sitting there with nowhere to go. And it, it all got blown out of the market in a, in a relatively short period of time, which in turn caused for prices to, to increase, uh, not just in the coastal areas, but down in the valley. Now, that does mean that there were some grapes that were not harvested and, and people needed to uh, take insurance, you know, get insurance claims against uh, grapes that weren't harvested. So it wasn't, you know, isn't great for everybody here. Uh, you know, some of the growers have taken a pretty significant hit this year. The flip side of that is the overall bulk market Pricing is better. It's more in line with historical norms, and we're not sitting on such a such a huge excess of inventory that's that's really depressed the market here for the last couple of years. So it seems to me you've got two things going on though in California. On the one hand, you've got Central Valley growers who, over the last decade, have been questioning the financial viability of grape production and winemaking, and should we switch to almonds or olives or whatever. Um, you've got water issues, obviously, and which ties in with that. And then on the other hand, you've got these fires, which you've, we, we know about this year's fires, but we had fires last year, we've had fires a number of years. Um, if for anybody, and, and we've got the cost of insurance going forward, this must be a very challenging time for anybody in the uh, California wine industry. Forget what we've seen up until now, looking forward into 21-22, this is challenging, isn't it? It's challenging on all fronts. That's, that is a fact. I mean, we, not, only, uh, not only do we have the pressures that you've, that you've mentioned with the water and, and uh, viability of, of growing uh, grapes in the market, um, one thing I should add, we also, it looks like we've had a pretty small crop here again in California in 2020. So that's, that's been helpful for the market and that's, that will continue to be helpful and that will be helpful for the grape market in 2021. We're already seeing activity in 2021 in the grape market, which is early. And that's a good indication that prices will be fairly strong. So uh, yes, you are correct. We, we saw a lot of vineyards, uh, especially in the Valley, uh, pulled and and uh, turned into orchards, almond orchards and and other nuts. Um, unfortunately, that market's taken a big hit now. That almond market's taken a big hit because a lot of that product was going to China. And uh, right. given our given our current trade relation with China, as you, you can imagine, they've backed off quite a bit. So uh, now we're starting to see almond orchards come out. Some of the older older orchards are coming out and and very few being planted. Um, we're not seeing a lot of vines going in the ground. So it's not, it isn't a, it isn't a rush back to planting vineyards yet, but, but being, you know, being in the agricultural business in the, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley is, is a little bit difficult right now. Um, so I do think in the next couple of years, great prices will be relatively good over the, you know, if you took the average over the past 10 years. So when we talk about grape prices, you've got this matrix of grape varieties and regions. So Napa Cabernet, arguably, and the best bits of Napa up at the top, and obviously yeah. the lowest grapes. At the, um, what? So Pinot Noir, we talked earlier about this. Pinot Noir was, was one of the grapes that suffered in the fires this year, I believe. It was. was that so right? Pinot. So in terms of smoke paint, potentially. It was, and it was actually at the same time. It was one of the varieties that, uh, as far as as far as the bulk market goes in the premium areas, it was one of the markets that was the most depressed. And the reason for that is Pinot became very popular here. We planted a lot in, you know, Russian River, Sonoma Coast, Monterey. We did a lot of planting over the past ten years. And that, as I keep mentioning, that 18 crop, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how big that crop was on the coast here and what that did to our market. So, so um, Pinot was significantly hurt by smoke taint this year. And what did that mean? Well, I'm going to give this to you in gallon pricing, but pricing on, you know, say Sonoma, Pinot went from a low of, let's call it $3 a liter 
uh, and it's now trading upwards of six dollars a liter. So, so you see, you see that happening in the bulk market. A lot of that 2020 won't be used. It will have been dropped and insurance taken on that 2020 crop. And then you're going to see a significant increase in pricing theoretically on the 2021 grape side on those. And also, presumably, this is not a bad time to be doing Pinot in, in Chile or in southern France or other places. Well, and if you look at the import side, so getting back to maybe uh, the import side, um, where we see opportunity long term, you, know, you just hit the nail on the head. It's Pinot and Sauvignon Blanc are two items that uh, are difficult to grow here in our in what we would call our value regions. You know, it's it's hard to grow Pinot and Sauvignon Blanc into a taste profile that uh, that the majority of consumers are looking for in that in that southern end of the valley. So you need to you need to move north to you know Lodi or or coastal. And, it, and it's just a little bit more expensive there. And so it's difficult to hit the price point you need to hit if you want to put that in a three liter box or a five liter box. Um, and so we do see significant trade from specifically on those two items, chili, see a lot of Pinot Noir and a lot of Sauvignon Blanc coming here uh, for, for programs uh, in, in the box and maybe the canned side of things or the 1.5 liters. Uh, we do see a lot of that. Um, and it's and that's it's very good value, um, and it's been difficult because of the great price is to get growers to plant Sauvignon Blanc here, because you don't as a grower you you, you make a better return on your land when you're planting Cabernet historically than if you're planting Sauvignon Blanc. So we just don't have that much. Now there's something else that's a phenomenon that, that interests me that I've seen in the in the states over the last I'd say decade. Um, led by, um, I guess, Dave Finney's The Prisoner, but now with a lot of other wines that have followed onto that, where you're getting premium wines. Uh, when I say premium, we're talking super premium, actually, at 20, 30, 40, 50, even more a bottle that don't actually, A, have a region. They may well be Napa or they may well be California blends. And secondly, that blend is crucial. I don't know what I'm getting. What I know is it's a, a red blend. It's got Zinfandel, it's got Cab, it's got everything. Those obviously are, in terms of margins, quite appealing to the producers because you can put those together from a number of different um, places. Um, but presumably that must make be quite interesting in terms of the bulk market because I could be, I might be looking for elements to make those blends. How, how has that changed life for you? Well, certainly this year, those uh, the the activity for those brands has really picked up, um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we see for those types of wines, we see those sourced in grapes and in bulk. Uh, uh, you know, for the big red blend type of wines or the or the uh, premium red blend, they're sourced mainly in the North Coast in Napa, and you see you see both grape and bulk purchases made on those wines. Um, it, it's been it's been certainly useful for the premium Zinfandel regions, uh, Cabernet, Petit Verdot, all those types of things uh, are are good for those blends, um, and it's and and I would say it's been um, it's been very active and it's been it's been great for those blender reds. So so you talk about Napa Cab, um, Napa Cab is you know year in and year out it's pretty pretty solid, expensive. You feel you know this last couple of years there's been a little bit extra wine out there so a little bit depressed but those other blenders have found uh they've found a home yeah. in those in those red blends and in some cases you can you know you can pull some wine out of other regions either down on the central coast or even lodi uh to help bolster those wines and 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 to make them um as you say you know to help with the margin uh you can you can afford to go out and buy a 60 dollar a gallon wine uh, if you're if you're buying something from fifteen dollars a gallon in Lodi and you're blending them together in, in a California Appalachian. Now there's something else I've been watching and I'd, I'd be interested to hear your input because you'd see this. As of last year, the buzz was that private label was on a roll. Um, obviously Total is, is, is very big on that um, but Everyone, there seemed to be this growth in, in private label that was threatening a lot of, of existing brands. My, what I'm hearing this year is that people, because they're, um, people have been playing safe 
And some of the big brands seem to have actually picked up market this year. And I'm hearing that private label is not as strong. Is that, is that true? Uh, well, what, what we're seeing in the numbers is that some of you are correct. The big brands are doing very well. And so uh, people are, I, and I don't know the psychology of it, but it does feel like people maybe are going back to what is comfortable in these times and, and going back to those brands. Uh, I would say equally as important, you know, the cost of bulk wine, you know, a lot of private label deals, as you, as you probably know, those aren't multi-year deals that they're, that people are doing with retailers. Sure. In most cases, it's year to year. And it's a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tender model, similar to what you see in the UK when you have the, you know, Tesco putting out a tender every year for each, each wine in each market. It's, it's, it's great in years when you have a lot of bulk wine out there. Because if you're the if you're the retailer, you're you're going to be able to you know have a lot of margin and 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 have your choice of wines. What's happened this year is as we've just been discussing in California, uh, a lot of wine left the left the market. It got sucked out of the system, which caused a huge increase in price. So if you were doing a if you were doing a deal with a retailer last year uh, on a private label at say you were selling them, you know, selling them something that had a wine cost in it of say, you know, $3 a liter. And now that wine cost is at $6 a liter. That's a lot less attractive to the retailer. And so a lot, it, so, so there's, there's, there's a lot of forces here at work, uh, not only uh, consumer preference, but market reality. Now you've just mentioned Tesco in the UK that, uh, that raises an interesting area, which is Brexit. Obviously, I'm in the UK. I see that. But the UK is a very big wine exporter. Everyone forgets about this. And that's not English sparkling wine we're talking about. That is wine that's come in from the US, from Australia, from Chile, New World generally, bottled here and for re-export into Europe. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty, I believe, over what's going to happen to that. Whatever the deal that Britain does with the, the EU, does it, will it make sense to be running all those bottling lines in the UK? What are you hearing? Well, I think the, there, are, there are a lot of options for bottling in Europe. Uh, the UK has been attractive. Um, we'll say, it's hard to say at this point. There, there, may be, there may be advantages to being in the UK after Brexit, from a, depending on how it all shakes out with uh, wine regulations between the EU and the UK. It may be easier to blend and bottle in the UK than it would be if you were going to go take your wine to say Germany or Italy or somewhere else. So there may be there. It, it really depends on on how this thing ends up. Um, but I, what I would say is there you know there are alternatives and and we have to keep our eye on that and you know, you know there's there's plenty of bottling space and availability availability uh, in other countries in Europe and so um, it is it is certainly a risk at this point I think it's still a little bit early to say I haven't been hearing uh, of any great uh, exodus from the bottling market in the UK at the, at this moment. Uh, I think with Brexit for, for my business and for California, it's been t difficult because UK is a really good market for California wine in, you know, you the big brands, Echo Falls and Blossom Hill. Uh, since Brexit began, those, those brands in particular, which are so important to us, have not done uh, as well as they had traditionally in those markets. And so that's been, that's been a significant uh, issue for California export. Uh, and that's the, the other interesting thing we're seeing is retailers are tending that there's this move of retailers working together and trying to buy. So you've got Aldi, I think, famously doing it, but also Tesco talking to Carrefour and so on. The idea of saying, well, instead of us buying this and you buying that, why don't we work together and um, be coming into the market and saying we need this much wine? rather than yeah. this and this and this. Is that something you're seeing happening in, in the bulk market? Uh, well, it's, we, we see that in Europe. We don't see that so much here, right? That's not... No, but in the uh, sense of know, Europe, is a, it's a European phenomenon, I think. Yeah, um, it, it is. I Look, Europe's been, been, historically speaking, relatively less active than it was pre-COVID. 
Um, so we are we're seeing different strategies. I, to me, it would be it would be much better to see some of the European retailers work as if the as if those private labels were were actual brands and set up multi year arrangements. I think the uh, it, you know if I had my if I had my wish they would do that because I think their consistency of supply would be so much better and in the long term I believe the pricing would probably end up being better uh, for the retailer. Um, but there are yeah it seems like new she's coming out on how to tackle uh, private label in these big retailers. Um, going around the bottlers through the bottlers we see that happen you know one year on one year off and so it's it's you know we'll see we'll see where it all goes but we we definitely are seeing different strategies uh out there this year that we hadn't seen in the past and uh, in terms of the i mean so it's cupcake is a good example i heart in in the german owned well british created german owned brand the idea of a single um uh, brand that covers wines from all over the place. So if I buy um, a bottle of cupcake um, Shiraz, it could be Australian, but it doesn't have to be Australian. It's it, um, is that an area people have tried it in the past. Matthias Rose at one point started to make pink wine in different countries. It didn't really work. Lindemann did it in Australia, and it didn't really work it does seem to be now something that is a reality where if i go into a store in the states and i pick up a pinot noir it doesn't necessarily the brand may be a brand that i'm familiar with for california wine but that pinot noir doesn't necessarily have to come from the us does it and that could switch from it, year to year it, and indeed market to market it can um it's a little bit more difficult at the premium level now you mentioned yeah, i'm talking at the, the um, en entry level yeah, that sort of level yeah it's i'll tell you where it's uh, uh i'll tell you where it has been it's been very successful so 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 what happens here in the market and and why it's difficult at the premium level it's it's difficult to do that in the 750 milliliter package and the reason for that is the way the stores are set up uh generally what happens if you have a wine that is a traditionally California brand and you put, let's call it Chilean Cabernet or Australian Shiraz, as you say, instead of, instead of a California Shiraz or Cabernet, in short order, that particular SKU will get moved out of the California or the, it'll get moved out of the Syrah or the Pinot set down to the import set. And when it gets down to the import set, Unfortunately, in a lot of retailers, that's that's what we call no man's land. There's there's nobody down there. Uh, there's nobody looking there. So so and that's different in different regions. But that's been the big problem with with doing that. Where we've seen tremendous success is in alternative packaging. And what I mean by that is the three liter, the five liter cans, one point five liter, anything other than a seven fifty. Uh, there's, that's where you see a lot of import wine end up and getting changed and moved and moved about. And, and the reason for that is there's one section for all of that. And so it, it doesn't get moved regardless of if, if the supply is getting moved, that box or that, or that can or that bottle, that one five, it stays in the same slot and the consumer and can come back for, and find it. That also can be true for rosé, can't it? Because there, there's, there's often a, a wall of rosé that, that is separate, that everything fits in. That is separate. But but it could get but if your rosé now you're you're right in most of the stores here the rosés are all together, uh, so you would find the Provence rosé next to the Napa rosé. In some cases, it theoretically could get moved, but but rosé would would be another good example. There's a reference somebody's just come through and says Tussock Jumper is an international brand, and that's one of those brands I see that that does work very very um, well. Um, in terms of well, you, has the can sorry. I was going to say, you are yeah. seeing companies, some of these large U.S. companies, they have strategies where they do have what we'll call world brands in other markets than the U.S. So you'll see some of the big, big players here that might sell uh, Chilean wine in their brand in Brazil because there's a better uh, trade, you know, there's a better trade yeah. deal than there is between the U.S. and Brazil. And, and you'll see some of that. You see less of it 
coming in as you do see uh, see those brands going out. Now, this is a contentious area, and I'd be interested to know what, what you, whether you see any of this. But in the last um, year or so, two of the things that we've seen really, I think, explode. One is celebrity wines, where every mm. everybody seems to have a wine. And that is obviously an area where presumably bulk must fit. I don't know whether yes. you see it directly. Um, and secondly, yes. there is this other category, which is clean wines. And it's because Cameron Diaz um, straddles both by being a celebrity yes. who has a clean wine. Any thoughts on that? I've got some other questions coming through in a second, but uh, any thoughts on well, those? Well, there's, there's certainly growth in both. Uh, I would say uh, from the celebrity wine, you know, generally what you see is is the, the celebrity will team up with one of the larger, you know, corporate entities here uh, and, and, will, and will have varying degrees of... Uh, input into the production side and, and usually not so much the marketing and sales side, but they'll have some uh, some input into the production side and the taste profile on that. And that's that's been very successful. I mean, I think you have, uh, you know, you see Dave Matthews has had his dreaming tree for a yeah. long time. Uh, Zach Brown, uh, Zach Brown band, they've, they've teamed with uh, Delicato and, and have had a lot of success there. Uh, Snoop Dogg, Post, Mo Post Malone, great. Snoop Dogg, huge. Yeah, yeah. so there's so that which is great. All of that's great. I mean, I think it it introduces uh, people to to wine that might not otherwise think about going to wine, but when they see their favorite celebrity out there uh, making wine, promoting wine, that's that's a good thing in our opinion for for the business overall. The clean wine um, is it feels like that's a little bit of 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 the wine industry's answer to the hard seltzer. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, the way a hard seltzer is marketed, uh, it's, you know, it's basically driven by the, the number of calories that they put on the can in huge yeah. letters. No gluten, I mean, if you look no at, salt, no, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And so now uh, that's obviously something in this market where uh, the consumer is interested in knowing what's in, the, in, what's in the food they're eating and what's in the beverages that they're drinking. And so clean wine is, is answering that question for a lot of people. You know, Fit Vine is out there. I think they've been very successful. People want to know how many calories are in, a, in every glass. People want, and, and, yeah. and here, you know, we don't have a lot of that information on the package. And so this is, this is a way for, to reach that segment. And it, it seems to be popular and successful. Now, a couple of questions that actually I was going to come on to and some people are asked as well. So traditionally, the sourcing markets so as, a, as a broker, the ones that you're used to buying, and have there been shifts to other destinations over the last few years and overlapping with that? And has Eastern Europe, um, obviously Romania, Hungary, Moldova, how much have they um, moved to the U.S.? Mark for bulk if they have what's changed argentina obviously has grown over the last few years what else is what's been changing i mean i think that so so we do see we do see trade with these with these different places ebb and flow so we see uh you know like for a while south africa was extremely popular here not because it was south african but because the pricing worked and and at that time uh chile was uh, Chile had suffered their earthquake, and so there was supply disruption coming to the U.S. And so all of a sudden, South Africa looked like it was the, you know, the hot the hot market to for California or for the U.S. Excuse me, but the reality is it was more by selling it was more the varietal. You know, we needed they, we needed Chardonnay here, and we couldn't get it in the places where it was traditionally uh, being produced uh, at the right price. So so we've seen we've seen things move around based on price in different markets, based on, uh, you know, Mother Nature giving us a short crop somewhere, or uh, like I said, an earthquake or something, or rains in the middle. You know, Ar Argentina suffered through a couple of crops in a row where they had horrible rains all through the harvest and, and, and things like that. What I would say for, you know, as far as Eastern Europe goes, we don't necessarily see a lot of that come, come into the market here. We had seen, we'd seen a little bit of it uh, back in the, I would say, late 90s, you know, Bulgaria, uh, when, you know, when we first started importing into, into California, when, when, you know, after the French paradox, 60 minutes deal, you know, things really picked up here a lot faster than we planted. And so we were importing from everywhere. And Bulgaria was a place back then uh, for Merlot. Um, 
yeah. you know, and in Chile Cabernet. and these other places, yeah. and Cabernet. Today, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, you, you, you see some of that Eastern European wine coming into North America, but a little bit more towards Canada than, than here. And the, and the reason for that is they have their, uh, their programs, which are basically import blends with, with some Canadian wine in it. Uh, and that can pretty much come from anywhere, and they're not trying to, uh, they're not trying sure. to market the region. Sure. They're marketing the varietal, and so that's where we see some of that. Um, Pinot Grigio is is something that you do see a bit of Hungarian or Romanian coming in, don't you? Uh, sometimes when Italy when, when the price in Italy goes we, up, we see a bit of that. Uh, however, Australia has been a pretty good supplier to the U.S. for Pinot Grigio. And it's been a good supplier yeah. to Canada, and and the pricing has been good, and the quality is in the style is what the is what the buyer here expects. So I would say the demand has not been great enough to get the importers here to look so much outside of California, because we we have had a lot of Pinot Grigio here in California as well in the bulk yeah. market. Uh, they would a, a buyer here would traditionally probably first look to Australia, then Chile if they're not going to Italy, okay, let's say, and, it, and the Italian price has been pretty good as of late. That's been very, fairly competitive. So yes, Hungary and these other places have the, have the, have Pinot Grigio and have the availability and the pricing is good, but they're a little bit of, as a newcomer to this market, a lot of things have to go wrong in these other places first in order, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of back in line because they're trying something new when they do that. Now we talked earlier about those um, California red blends. I've seen some Spanish red blends in the U.S. market, not very many, but because uh, in Spain you can make those big, rich, um, yes. rich wines, fifteen percent alcohol, a bit of oak. Um, is that something? Because Spain doesn't have as much cab; it doesn't have the, the, the necessarily the volumes of of the the great varietals that that you want on the label. Is there an opportunity for non specific uh, grapes from places like Spain and maybe even Portugal? Well, we see Spain having two opportunities in the market here. One, yes, the red blend, uh, the nice, the, those types of wines. We do see some of that here and it comes over in bulk. Um, there has not yet been a tremendous need to import a lot of that. I think that will change this year as, as I've, you know, we talked about what happened in the market here and pricing and all of that. Um, so there is a possibility there. The other side of it is all of the organically grown product that comes out of Spain. I think, I think that market, it tied into your comments about clean wine. Um, the organic thing is starting to see some legs again. And, and the wine that comes out of Spain that is organic is priced at a level that works here. And so we do think it's, we're trying. We haven't had a tremendous amount of success yet, but we do think over time that that is a that is a nice opportunity for Spain. So, a good question that's come in. So, why does it's a very basic question? Why does the U.S. import three point six million hectoliters and export two point two million hectoliters? What's going on? What comes in and what goes out? I've got my eyes on that. I'd be interested to hear from you. So, from a bulk perspective. What comes in ends up, as I, as I mentioned, basically in those, um, what do we call alternative packages? And, yeah, and bag over, box, time, a lot of over time, those wines are cheaper than what is being exported, right? Yeah. So, so what's exported, uh, again, while it's coming from the value end of the California market, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at our, you know, our publications on, on, you know, pricing throughout the world, California at the, at the value end is always more expensive than everywhere else when it's, when it yeah. comes down to it, we're year in and year out, we're more expensive. So it's very difficult to hit the price points at the, and the five liter and some of these other packages uh, from California on a consistent basis where you can do that on the import side. So there's, there's some of that. Um, the, the export side, we have exporters. That we, don't, we don't have the volume of exporters that you might have in Chile, per se. So we have, we'll call them five major bulk exporters here, uh, really focused on maybe two or three of them. Um, where in Chile, you might have 15 major exporters. Yeah. Um, 
but but there's there's a lot at play there. You know, the the exports have have dwindled over time. We've had you know this is, we we have had in the past this duty drawback system, which uh, it's it's a bit of a uh, it's a it's a it's a way to promote exports. You know, you if you export, you can import duty free and tax free mm-hmm. and that went away for a time. Um, and when that went away, we did see exports fall. So um, that's back. Duty drawback is back. So I think we're going to, we're going to see a bigger push on export again. Uh, although markets out there are, are difficult, but, but there's more incentive for some of these wineries to export. Um, the other side of the import is we had, we had this craft beverage modernization act uh, that, that came into play three years ago which allowed importers here to take advantage of a tax credit uh, that could be assigned to them by the exporter. So every exporter in the world had a certain amount of assignable credits that they could give to U.S. importers. Yeah. And so we did see a bunch of U.S. importers jump into the market that might not otherwise have done that. And they came up with new projects and new ideas to, to import. Um, there is a sunset on that CBMA. And it's uh, and that is in you know in a month here, and it has not been approved to move on. So we may lose some of those importers, and if if that uh, if that carrot isn't still out there, that that remains to be seen. But our guess is that it will make up for it with the with the duty drawback. Um, there's a question here: How come Canada is one of the main exporters of bulk wine to the U.S.? Well, it's not Canadian wine, is it? Uh, there's a yeah. There's. There's a, again, <laughs> that comes down to, to tariffs and trade and tax. Yeah. And so there, yeah. with the, the, uh, with the, the former NAFTA agreement, I don't know what the new agreement's called uh, that was renegotiated, but there, there are, that's, that's a favorable trade route. And so there's yeah. some wine, uh, it's essentially made in Canada and gets pushed across the, pushed across the, uh, the border uh, comes here, and, and there's a significant tax advantage to doing that. And, and it's a it's basically a value wine that goes into a blended, blended wine. Yeah, and I think the the previous question, I think the important thing to say is that a lot of the imports, the bulk imports that come into the U.S., go into wine that isn't if it's branded, it's branded right at the bottom end of the level of of, of the market. Whereas what U.S. exports tends to be branded, whether it's Echo Falls or Gallo or whatever, it, it has a name on it. So that's that that is where your value added, I think, um, comes in. Well, so the last and, and, thing I think we yeah we've made this oh. argument for some time that. You know, what's imported is going into U.S. owned brands generally in bulk. What's imported in bulk is going yeah. to U.S. owned brands and, and they have shelf space. And there's generally California wine alongside some of those varietals. So you, you might see a you might see a Chilean cab or Merlot sitting next to a California uh, white Zinfandel or Pinot Grigio or, you know, even, a you know, I don't know, so you know, a, a Syrah, all in a line, but they need to protect that shelf space, and so sure. so that company will protect their shelf space and be able to, um, uh, um, you know, keep moving forward that way. They then export that same company is exporting their wine mainly to Canada, Europe, a little bit to Asia, but that's all being sold as California, and it is, yeah. and then when it's on a bottle, it's sold as California wine. The stuff that's being sold that's imported, the bulk wine coming in at that value end, it's being sold as varietal. And it's very hard as a consumer to really know where the wine originated. But you do know it's Chardonnay and you know it's yeah. Yeah. Um, it's there. I think we it's very yeah. difficult. It says, well, now we've used a lot of your time. I think we're really coming very much to an end. So I appreciate this a lot. But one quick question, and this may be too hard. Um, we don't see the uh, any immediate uh, reduction on those, as you said. Taking away the twenty-five cent tariff is not on anyone's priority list necessarily. Can you, assuming we do now have um, a change in regime on on the twentieth of January, is there anything the wine industry might expect to see change under a Biden presidency uh, compared to what we've seen over the last four years? Well, the que- I mean, the big the big difference for the wine industry over the last uh, the last period of time here, this, these last four years, is is the, is the addition of all these tariffs, and that 
you know, that's been significant, not only for people on the other, you know, on the, on the origin end, but here, these importers here have, have taken it, you know, pretty hard. It's been, it's been difficult. Um, I, I don't foresee any new tariffs. You know, you mentioned the hundred percent tariff that was hanging out there. I, we don't foresee that, that, that taking place at this point. Uh, at some point we see, we, we certainly believe, um, with our traditional trading partners in Europe and places our allies, we we probably see a, a more, you know, a favorable way of of uh, managing through some of these disputes. And there always will be disputes in other industries that don't don't include wine. But we we think uh, you know in the short run nothing new as far as new tariffs. Longer term, probably not this year. You are going to see uh, lower. You know, some of these tariffs, especially out of Europe. Uh, lowered or going away. Uh, in the meantime, you know, keep in mind you can you can still ship bulk wine from Europe here and not pay those tariffs as long as you're bottling right. it here. So there's, yeah. you know, for the people that that look at this kind of thing, it's you know there there are alternatives. It, it's helped the bulk. Yeah. It helps the bulk. It's not great for Burgundy, but it helps the bulk. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Greg, thank you very, very much for this. I really appreciate your time. It's been a fascinating session. This is all going to be on YouTube. So people can okay. catch up on this um, later on, and I'm sure a lot of people will do so. Um, and I wish you, um, well, it's a good day for you because it's morning, so enjoy the rest of your day. Yes. And thank you again for your time. Just briefly, anybody who hasn't seen them, um, uh, the Seattle reports, which you just go onto the seattle.com uh, website, you can register for that. Both the reports on the regional uh, bulk markets for the, the world market and the US. Um, I, it's something I keep a, a very close eye on because it gives you a very good idea on what's happening across the world. And that gives me an opportunity to talk about what we're going to be talking about tomorrow, um, where uh, we're talking with Bernard Fontenez of Origin Wines, who I, I know you know, Greg, um, from yes. who actually produces wine in South Africa and in, indeed in Argentina, and is both in the bulk market and in the fair trade market, particularly in South Africa, and also in the bottled market. So I'm looking forward to that same time tomorrow. So thank you, Greg. Keep on, hang on back to us and watching these, these sessions, everybody else. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you.